Hello, everyone. I am Dana Beebe of the programs team at the Columbia Global Center in Amman. Thank you for joining us today for a reading and conversation with Najib Bakhti on his debut novel, Between Beirut and the Moon. Najib Bakhti graduated from the American University of Beirut. He has a Master's of Arts in Creative Writing from the University of Westminster and a PhD in Creative Writing from Lancaster University. He has been published in The Guardian and The New Statesman, among others, and he has been interviewed by The National, The London Magazine, and The Middle East Eye. Between Beirut and the Moon, published by Influx Press, is his first novel. Born and raised in Beirut, Naji spotlights this complex capital from the eyes of the local youth living in post-Civil War Lebanon. Wildly evocative, unrelentingly witty, and grippingly realistic, the narrative powerfully conveys the unique experiencing sorry, experiences of coming of age in Beirut during the first decade of the century. Between Beirut and the Moon has been characterized by reviewers as laugh out loud funny with so much heart and as relevant for Lebanon today as it would have been 14 years ago. We are delighted to be involved and to have the opportunity to share this work with a broader audience. The global centers are hubs of Columbia University, currently in nine cities around the world that work with students, faculty, and regional partners to create opportunities for shared learning and research and to deepen the nature of global dialogue on a range of issues. This book talk is part of a series that features Arab authors to showcase some of the breadth and diversity in Arab fiction writing. Between Beirut and the Moon is a book for everyone. It is layered with Lebanese charm and timely as it makes accessible the complicated political, economic, and religious tensions that still simmer in Lebanon today. Through a combination of dark humor and fragmented narration, Naji's bittersweet story soars and reminds us of the human agency and paradoxes of a vibrant, turbulent, complicated city. I would now like to hand over to AJ Nadav, who will serve as the moderator for this conversation. AJ is an independent multimedia journalist and translator. His journalism work has appeared in the LA Review of Books, The Washington Post, The Intercept, Columbia Journalism Review, and other outlets. Most recently, he published a translation of Palestinian Syrian scriptwriter Hassan Sami Youssef's 2016 book, Threshold of Pain, alongside Nick Lobo and Rebecca Jebin. Thank you again to everyone in our virtual audience for being with us. We encourage you to send in your questions through the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. We will address them in the latter half of this webinar. Please join me in welcoming AJ. Thank you. Welcome everyone, ahlan wa sahlan. Um, it's an honor to be here and to welcome a special guest, the Lebanese author Naji Bakhti. Thank you also to Columbia Global Center's Amman for hosting this fruitful conversation. I would urge um, everyone to check out their upcoming talks where they'll be featuring other Arab authors from across the Middle East. Naji, I'd like to add that Between Beirut and the Moon is a great read, equally for those who barely know anything about Lebanon and for those who are intimately familiar with the country. In fact, I would say that Between Beirut and the Moon deserves a spot in a university syllabus on contemporary post-Civil War Lebanese fiction written in English alongside works by Rabia al maldin Lina Monzur, and Rawi al hajj among others. You weave humor into heavy topics such as conflict and sectarianism through the lens of a young protagonist coming of age in post-Civil War Beirut. However, since 2008, where your book ends, the small Mediterranean country uh, of Lebanon has continued to witness tragedy upon tragedy unfold. Today, like your main character, Adam, the Lebanese are still dreaming for the moon. To sum up the past decade, Civil War era lords have, con have continued to rule over Lebanon, leaving the country with crumbling infrastructure, a bloated public sector, and one of the world's highest debt ratios. These grievances, in addition to the crippling economy, were the source of ire that brought Lebanese to the streets on October 2019. Now, Beirut is not foreign to protest. I think of the You Stink movement in 2015, 2016, which came in response to the government's failure to solve a, a waste crisis. Yet the Thora or the revolution that erupted last October was unprecedented in both its size and national unity. Since then, Lebanon has um, been struck with the coronavirus pandemic. And then as is all well known on August 4th um, of this past year, 
2,700 tons of nitrate exploded from the port, ending 200 lives and destroying more than 300,000 homes, decimating large parts of the city. This blast was a, a result directly from government neg negligence, and the same government is, is responsible for an investigation into the cause of the blast. By the hour, the economy continues to deteriorate, and the local currency has lost 90% of value in the past year. So Najee, and this is my, after painting that grim picture of Lebanon in the past decade and, and bringing it to current events, my question for you is, um, what made you write this book? And then more specifically, can you please address why did you conclude the book's plot in 2008 and not more recently, given all that's happened in Lebanon in the past year and a half? Um, well, thank you. Thank you, AJ, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And thank you, uh, Dana, as well, and uh, for the, to the Columbia Global Centers for, for hosting this. Um, yes, I mean, the, the idea uh, of writing the book came to me, ironically, or perhaps predictably, um, when I had left uh, Beirut. I'd spent uh, my entire life up to the age of 21 or so uh, living in Beirut. And uh, by uh, Beirut, I mean um, this very much the city. Um, and it took um, leaving, uh, leaving Beirut and going to, to the UK to, uh, to, to study. Uh, for me to realize that actually what I really wanted to write about was uh, was my my hometown, um, and uh, yeah, initially uh, my first it, it was ironic because I spent my entire life sort of building up towards the moment when I would uh, leave Beirut because it had become something of a rite of passage for young men and women to to seek. Um, education or job opportunities or uh, really anything uh, abroad um, and uh, the idea just seemed natural and when I got there at uh, London that is um, that's when uh, I started thinking about what uh, what I what they would have been like uh, to grow up in and uh, to come of age uh, in and um, of course, it, it helped that my master's course at the time was uh, was a writing in the city course, and uh, after spending the first night uh, in a very cold room uh, when I got to London, that with without uh, double glazed glass and uh, uh, and without a duvet because for some reason I, I had not thought to buy a duvet ahead of time, um, and going to class the next day and the instructor the lecture. Uh, asked us to write about the city, and by the city uh, he meant London. Uh, but of course, all I could think of was Beirut. So, and I'd not seen them. So I, uh, I just wrote about Beirut, and um, and it just, yeah, uh, spiraled from there. Uh, and I suppose that's how the the novel began. The idea of wanting to write about uh, Beirut is. Um, in English, in particular, was uh, because in many ways books written in English about Beirut had been written by the diaspora, and uh, and books written in Arabic about Beirut uh, had been written by uh, perhaps Lebanese people living in Beirut. Now that's not necessarily true of uh, of all novels about the city, but uh, but certainly seems to be the rule. Um, and I'd, I'd sort of wanted uh, to write about uh, Beirut in English. And even though I was in London and in Lancaster and going back and forth between Beirut and those two cities, um, to, to my mind, it always seemed like I was living in Beirut somehow. And the idea that I was still writing from Beirut to the world uh, or from Beirut to Beirut, with the world listening in, um, as opposed to writing from the world back to Beirut. Um, so yes, that was the idea. Uh, as, as for your second question about um, why it is that I um, 
did not continue writing about Beirut um, as part of the novel uh, to include the events of, of, of today or of the last couple of years. Um, truth be told, um, that's a very uh, practical issue. I'd uh, already signed the contract with the publishing house and the novel had been, had been, had already been um, set to be published in June of 2020. Uh, little did we know, of course, and that uh, everything that would come later on and um, when, when to, with the revolution, with uh, the economic crisis, with the corona pandemic, with the Beirut ex port explosion, of course. Um, and I'm sure that that would make um, one hell of a novel for whoever uh, embarks on that uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. And despite me knowing that the protagonist is Adam, it took me a while to divorce Adam from my own preconceived notion that the book is not autobiographical. Um, you know, so I wanted to ask you how many of, of the events in the book are memories from firsthand experiences? There are parts in the book where, you know, it, especially I'm thinking of scenes with the explosion where it's like, you, ha you, you have the sense because of how, how real the writing feels that only someone who's lived those experiences could write about them. The same could be set, said about, you know, your, the take on Adam coming from a mixed background and his loathe to sectarianism. Um, there's a passage in the book, for example, where he changes his religion um, after getting slapped in the, uh, after refusing to turn the other cheek um, and, and pronounces, you know, I'm not a Christian, I'm a Muslim, and he, he punches him back. And so I wanted to, to turn this on to you and ask you how many of these are, were based off of lived experiences? Well, um, yeah, you've clearly done your homework. Uh, <laughs> I've done due diligence. Uh, yes, I think um, th that's a fair question. It's um, uh, the truth is, um, a cliche that you know you do write about what you know and uh, of course what I know is Beirut and um, uh, my friends in Beirut and my family and uh, going to school um, and and with the war happening in the background um, it was never the main event it always seemed to sort of uh, interrupt the main event, like, uh, you know, the government official exams that we had to sit for, or uh, prom, um, or uh, whatever else was going on in a, you know, typical teenage life. Um, and the war would just come in and you put a stop to that, or postpone it, or interrupt it, or something like that. And it seems trivial, of course, to talk about war in that, uh, in that manner, but... Um, uh, that's exactly what a teenager, uh, for the most part, would see the war as. Apart, of course, from those moments when um, you're hiding in the, in the bathroom or the toilet um, uh, in your family home and, and genuinely afraid of uh, a... Um, bomb um, or a, an RPG rocket landing uh, in your, uh, you know, on your home or uh, on someone you love. And, uh, and that part, of course, is, is where the emotion is a little bit more heightened and the uh, sarcasm and, you know, satirical nature um, and the uh, the reverent nature of, of the teenage life would have to take a back seat. Uh, and because suddenly you are confronted with life or death situations and, uh, and the real possibility of losing someone you love or uh, losing your life or um, being put in an, in an unen un un excuse me, unenviable situation. Um, so... Yes, to, to that end, I would say uh, no. The short answer is no. It's it's not autobiographical. Um, um, fortunately or unfortunately, I uh, I you know in in some sense I wish my life were as as thrilling as uh, as that. But uh, in another sense, of course, um, I would I was spared uh, having to deal with uh, much of what I made my protagonist go through in the novel. Um, uh, 
uh, thankfully. And um, yes, I, I believe uh, I hope that that um, somewhat answers answers your question. Definitely, it it got me thinking about you know um, this 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 question about your your use of humor in the novel. And it seems like you sort of asked yourself and you answered, is humor appropriate when writing about war, right? And, and when we had just talked about uh, this earlier, you said that perhaps uh, for those who had actually lived the Civil War, um, this, this tone may, might have been out of place, but that for your uh, generation, the distance is what allowed you to be funny. So I'm thinking about distance, not just distance from the city, but distance also from from the war that ended, you know, nominally ended in 1990 um, and, and growing up in, in the background of that. So did you end up, can you talk a little bit about this? Certainly. Um, yeah, the idea that um, the, the use of humor uh, when discussing war, um, the truth is that in many ways, because of the absurd nature uh, of war, especially if it goes on uh, for a while, and it becomes sort of part of daily life. There's something um, funny uh, about that. Um, perhaps not in the typical sense, maybe some in a, in a mad, uh, out of sorts sense, but um, um, there's also, as you mentioned, the idea that this distance, um, this generational distance between my myself and uh, the generation that went through the um, civil war. So perhaps uh, many of the writers who grew up and experienced the civil war, grew up in the civil war, um, will have um, written about it in a, in a much more somber, uh, grave tone, which it of course deserves to be written about because it is a very uh, somber and, and grave subject. Um, uh, you know, authors like V.S. Khoury or uh, Rawi Haj, will have, have uh, written about the civil war in, in, in such terms. But the idea, I think, uh, behind my novel is the fact that I am, I grew up after the civil war uh, and myself, and uh, the narrator of the novel also grew up um, after the civil war. And so uh, the idea is that this is a child who grew up listening to stories about the civil war uh, from, um, his parents and his grandparents, and by putting together these fragments of the Civil War, which seemed, of course, absurd uh, in, in many ways, um, he was able to form some idea of what had happened. And that distance um, allows the narrator and allows me as an author to uh, insert some of the humor that, uh, that, that I was able to, to, to incorporate. Of course, humor by nature, um, is a, some sort of mirror, but also um, a, a gateway into reflection and discussion. And the idea is that this humor would allow, therefore, certain things which had remained unsaid up to this point to be said, to be talked about, um, to be discussed in such a way that uh, had not been possible uh, before. Mm -hmm. And I think what's also uh, very appealing about the book is that you write it, and as I mentioned earlier, in a way where someone who's unaware of contemporary Lebanese history can still pick it up and learn about a lot about it and enjoy the ride uh, of the story. And you do a lot, so you do a lot of explaining, right? You call this to me Arab, Arab splaining or Leb splaining, and it works really well. Um, also for those who, who are Lebanese, you know, I, I gave it to a Lebanese friend and she said there was, it was nice to see references of home. Um, like you said, to, to hear ta taboos talked about and then also to be discussed in a way um, that perhaps hadn't been thought of before. So can you talk a little bit about this Arab explaining that goes on? Who was your intended audience um, and why this language? Yeah, thank you uh, for that, AJ. Certainly, I think it, so it all starts with the in, intended audience and, and the language, I think, uh, and the idea that the choice of language was English here. And therefore, the idea that, you know, because this was written in a, in a, in a foreign language uh, still, this is not the narrator's native language. Uh, so it's being written out of language, out of place in a way. Um, and 
as such, this sort of um, this this comes into play, um, and I wanted the narrator to be aware of this, uh, not to ignore the fact that he or she was you know, speaking or writing. Uh, he rather was speaking or writing in English, um, and. Um, with that comes the idea that uh, you are speaking, therefore, to a um, perhaps a, a native speaker of English, someone who might not know very much about Lebanon or the Middle East, for that matter. And um, of course, you know, you, you might argue, um, well, but there are lots of Lebanese people who um, do speak English, and yes, of course, they're multilingual, but. Um, the idea is that they would then be in on the joke. Um, they would listen in as the narrator tries to explain to this, um, you know, perceived uh, foreign uh, audience, um, explain certain uh, Lebanese mannerisms, certain, uh, uh, you know, Le Lebanese uh, traits, um, um, monuments, historical events, uh, personalities. Uh, and a Lebanese person will be familiar with all of that. But the, this is a chance to insert humor as well. Um, so the, this is a, a young man's take on all of, all of the atrocities that have gone on before, on, um, on all the absurdities uh, involved in the Lebanese political life and, uh, and the, the uh, Lebanon in general and the region in general as well. And so, um, Yes, I think that certainly the, the language comes into play as a, as a tool for humor, but also um, as, a, as a confrontation of, uh, or a breaking of the fourth wall um, and an ability to, to use that uh, in order to connect with a, a perceived audience that is foreign, but also while connecting with uh, the Lebanese audience who uh, would hopefully find, find some, of, some of the uh, narration to be humorous or funny. Mm. So it sounds like from, from what you're saying that a large percent, and I, I know this as well, of, of Lebanon speaks English, then it would have access to this book. But what about those Lebanese that don't speak English, that are either French educated or just, you know, speak Arabic? I mean, it's quite remarkable to think of a country where people are mi multilingual. So did you ever think about publishing this just in Arabic or writing this in Arabic? Um, or ha and, and since you didn't, do you think about publishing this in Arabic down the road, meaning translating it either yourself or having a translator uh, do that? Uh, well, I mean, of course, that, that would be that is a possibility. But um, as I said, the, the, the novel was written very deliberately in English. And so much of the, the uh, narration is based on the idea and the acknowledgement uh, that this is the English language being used, or at least the foreign language that is not Arabic being used. And so the explanations that are given, uh, therefore, are explanations that um, um, depend on that uh, idea. So it, it might not work quite as well in, in Arabic, uh, and we we'll we'll yeah. might have to forego some of, some of the um, bits and pieces that, uh, that make this uh, self-conscious, um, you know, the breaking the fourth wall aspect and, uh, and all of that. And you wrote uh, Bites of the Novel in 2012 about the period in 26 to 2006 to 2008. But as we've talked about, um, and as many have reviewed it, it might as well have been written uh, about current events, about the recent explosion which decimated Beirut. Um, clearly, you didn't foresee those uh, tragic events, but it's uncanny how timely the book is. And so I want to give the readers, um, sorry, give the audience a sense of some of that language you use and why you specifically wrote it in English and how this comes across. Um, specifically, I'm thinking of a, a part you wrote about the July War in 28 or in 2006 that actually could have been written to describe the blast. So would you mind um, reading that for us? Um, sure. Yes, of course. Um, I'll just... Excuse me. Um, yes, uh, will that be page, line, page nine? Maybe? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'll just start then. Um, 
mother and father is a colloquial term used in Lebanon to express the idea of something whole or complete. For instance, the weight of the explosion knocked the man, mother and father, right out of the window, as men in, Be in Beirut occasionally are. Or the building collapsed, mother and father, to the ground, as buildings in Beirut occasionally do. Um, yes, yeah, so, so that's... Uh, I could also uh, be uh, on page 45, if you like. Sure. Uh, I saw that this part that you're about to read is also very timely because it speaks to the present um, exodus or migration crisis that's going on in Lebanon. So it'd be great if you could read that. Sure. Um, yeah. So many years later, long after I'd left Lebanon to pursue a higher education in London, my father would write a heartfelt article in an Nahar newspaper. It would be his, his final article before he retired. I curse the country, he would write. I curse the country that bid our children farewell with a smile across its face and told them to never return. I curse the country that presented our children with two alternatives, death or immigration, and instructed them to pick between the two. I curse the country that forced its parents to send their children to outer space, or worse, Europe, and wave silently from afar. I curse the country that gave our children water but no future, soil but no belief, light but no hope. I curse the country that stripped our children of their parents and us of them. I curse the country that made fools of us all and led us to believe that we would grow old watching our sons and daughters rise to greater heights amongst their fellow countrymen. I curse the country that brought me of my afternoon ara with my son. I curse the country that deprived me of the sight of this wispy beard, slowly maturing into one which resembles my own. I curse the country that resigned my wife and I to that comfortable couch in the living room, staring past broken shards of glass into the empty void that is tomorrow. I curse the country, mother and father. Oof, that just gives me goosebumps when I, when I hear it and when I read it. Um, and this is clearly from the perspective of Mr. Uh, Najjar, Adam's father, who is a journalist who had been writing um, uh, obituaries in the, in the local newspaper for years. And then this is his, his final article um, that's very clearly pessimistic. It's a very angry tone. It's an elegy, if you will, to Lebanon. Um, so I want to ask you this um, without foreshadowing too much of the book, but what sort of are the theoretical implications of your book as they translate into Lebanese life? Like, is, was this letter and this passage meant to be sort of, uh, you know, your thoughts on, on a hopeless future? Are you optimistic about what's going on about the future of Lebanon? Um, can, can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, so this uh, article, this passage, was uh, supposed to be the voice of the war generation, in a sense. Um, this is uh, Adam's father, who had lived through the war, the Civil War. And of course, this is a, a battered generation, a generation that had been through so much uh, from um, the Civil War itself, the economic crisis, um, in multiple wars, assassinations, um, invasions, bombing, etc., um, and and rebuilding, and then collapse again, and so on. And we're still obviously going through it. Um, and I mean, if you look at my generation um, and the people who are now in their twenties, thirties, um. They have already been through what would be enough for most generations as well, um, which is, you know, the, the, the Beirut uh, port explosion, but of course long before that, uh, the economic crisis and, and, um, and um, you know, the series of assassinations, uh, which happened between 2005-2013, uh, the 2008 issue, uh, uh, a conflict, uh, armed conflict in, in uh, Lebanon, the 2006 uh, bombing of Beirut uh, uh, by Israel. So, 
I think that and in and of itself is, is probably enough. Um, and of course, uh, initially, there might be some defiance of sorts. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the word that was used very often uh, about the Lebanese was resilience. But of course, that's a double edged sword in many ways, because um, it was used as a as a veil, if you like, or a, a fig leaf um, by the politicians and the ruling elite to cover their um, their misdeeds, their crimes, their uh, robberies, uh, and um, to, yeah, to say the least. And by claiming that the Lebanese people are resilient, uh, they are hoping that that would spur them to rebuild what they, the politicians, and the ruling elite have destroyed. And I, I don't know that my my novel can make any any difference. Um, there, um, I I would hope that um, there's more to Lebanon than what the ruling elite has allowed uh, has allowed um, to come to the fore uh, thus far. And uh, certainly, the revolution of October uh, 2017 gave everyone hope. It was very real. And um, uh, as as I wrote recently, you know, when whenever uh, a bomb would go off when we were kids. Um, my parents would say that it was fireworks um, because they didn't want me to, or, or my sister, to, to be afraid. And they would say, oh, it's nothing, dismissively, it's fireworks. And when when October 2017 happened, of course, you know, my parents maintained this up until we were adults. And then, of course, it became a joke, um, which sort of feeds into the novel. But uh, Recently, in the October 2000, uh, 2019 uh, revolution, um, when uh, when I was there myself, standing uh, on Jemaisi Street and uh, overlooking uh, some of the what was going on before delving in myself, um, you could see the the tear gas being launched, and you could see the the bullets being fired in the air. And this was uh, at night, and that almost, you know, in a way resembled fireworks. Um, and for the first time, you could also, you could almost believe in the fireworks, the idea that, you know, some change can come about, that um, something can happen. Uh, and within, I think, an hour or so, the, the Lebanese government at the time, uh, so this was, forgive me, this was August uh, after the port explosion, but carrying on from the spirit of October uh, 2019, um, but then an hour the, the government uh, fell or um, resigned. And um, of course, it was a public government to begin with, but uh, and it was a hollow victory, if you like. But uh, still, it was a, a moment of, of, uh, of change. Uh, uh, hence, that we can actually uh, have an impact. Um, and while we might not have you know, brought the world to its knees. Um, you know, we might have uh, damaged some egos and made a few of the politicians um, think twice about what they are doing. Um, and without accountability, there, there will be no moving forward, of course. Um, um, without the idea of, of, uh, of uh, making sure that those who committed the crimes pay for them. Uh, there will be no moving forward, and um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure that literature was made to to change the world. Um, was is coming from uh, from someone who who, uh, who deals with literature every day, I suppose. But uh, in a way, it's meant to hold up a mirror to mm -hmm. to the world to show it what's going on, um, and hope that the world changes uh, itself. I'm really glad that you didn't sort of that you talked about your personal experience and didn't talk about your intention as the writer and what you hope uh, the readers will get from this, because I agree with you that, you know, the beauty of literature is that it's open for countless interpretations. And so every reader will will get away from this book, a different perspective, understanding it will resonate in different ways with everyone. Absolutely. Now, 
there's an interesting question that I received, which is, do you feel the book could be therapeutic to people who have experienced war or civil strife? That's a, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, I think that um, that's, that's a question uh, better put to maybe the, the war generation, perhaps. Um, but it's certainly, from my experience of um, people of the war generation who've, who've read uh, the novel, um, there was, I think, uh, the idea that we might finally come to talk about it, because uh, perhaps most notably about the, the previous generation, uh, my parents' generation, uh, uh, or the war generation, they, for a while, for a long while, they didn't want to talk about the war. Um, uh, very much like that uh, uh, John Cleese uh, sketch. Um, they, they, they didn't want to talk about the war uh, because they feared that whatever they had to say would shake the very foundations of the country and cause the, the collapse of, of the very state, very unstable, already unstable structure that holds together, uh, barely holds together uh, the fabric of the country. And the idea was that they would just stay silent so that you know, nothing would, would change. But of course, to move forward, you do have to talk about the atrocities and the horrors that happened. Um, and even if that's, through uh, jokes and humor and uh, a bit more than that. Um, I hope I hope that, uh, that my novel might have had uh, um, some sort of uh, positive effect, if not therapeutic, uh, on those who, who uh, read, read it. I would say that, it, you know, it's in addition to the project of restoring historical amnesia, as you've talked about, you know, how even if you look at Lebanese uh, history textbooks, you know, because all the different sects haven't agreed on a war narrative, there isn't this narrative, it's not discussed. And so it's been up to Lebanese artists, writers um, to create and recreate war events. And I very much see this book as part of that. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to, to just to, uh, to follow on from that, I think uh, certainly the, this idea of um, I think the, the, this idea of, of the, the truth really doesn't um, doesn't quite exist in Lebanon because of the very fragmented nature of of the city itself and of the fabric of Lebanese society and so every fragment has its own particular truth and um, so like the way that we received these truths uh, as kids was. You learn about the Civil War, as I said, through these little stories and you put them together and then you have some disfigured idea of what went on. Um, and it's very particular to you because only you have those pieces. Someone else has very different pieces that perhaps don't fit together at all. And so this idea of the truth as a, as a sort of whole, uh, something that's complete and uh, that can be found um, behind a bookshelf or a tree or whatever, um, I, that doesn't really exist in Lebanon. It's, um, or any war torn country, I think. Um, because the truth is, as I said, all these, you know, million little pieces, and you're lucky if you find two or three or four of them and you're able to piece them together. And that's just part of the truth, uh, if you like. And it's, uh, and part of the truth is uh, perhaps indistinguishable from, from a lie. Mm -hmm. And now I want to turn to ask you about the writing process and how you're able to gather all of these narratives and put them in to, to this final work. And, and there's been questions and interest in the audience. And I want to address this for, um, for writers or prospective writers um, in the audience um, and artists, you know, um, how many drafts and rewrites did you go through until you felt uh, you were ready to, to move forward and that this was the final version you wanted published? Well, um, I initially started uh, writing the novel, although I didn't know it myself, in, uh, in 2011. Um, so it's taken about almost nine, ten years, or nine years, but to uh, actually uh, go from that to being published. Uh, but um, yes, it took a lot of uh, 
rewriting and 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 I think the process fed into the narrative, which fed into the place, which fed into the idea of coming of age, which is that this is a choppy, fragmented retelling uh, of a of a story, and um, and it's up to the reader in many ways to put the fragments together, and that's how I wrote it. I I wrote it in fragments, and then putting those fragments together, and swapping them, and rewriting them, and uh, and um, yes, that that was my my process anyway, and it was as as chaotic as uh, as you would expect, and as chaotic as as the country sometimes is. Mm, and it sounds like when what you've been describing as well, you know, that you were in London, and that this temporal distance helped you as well in the writing process. Do you find it more difficult to write when you were in Lebanon going back there? How is can you talk a little bit about the the dimension of of, of space and distance in, in your work and how that helps you? Yeah, I think it, it was a case of um, we talked about the, the generational distance, uh, but there was of course the spatial distance, which is I I was removed in some way from Beirut uh, when I was in London and Lancaster, but um, but I was going back and forth, and so. Um, it was writing the novel from within and from without Beirut. It was uh, both being in the city and outside the city, which I think was a, was a, was a fortunate perspective to have. Um, but also uh, the temporal distance, which is to say the fact that, um, and gen- or generational distance, the fact that I was at once removed by gen- through a generation uh, from, um, from the, the atrocities of the civil war, but also removed uh, via time um, from um, the from 2006 and 2008, um, where it, with the Israeli bombing and the armed conflict uh, in in Lebanon, and then the series of assassinations afterwards, and so that um, allowed me to that distance allowed me to. Uh, insert some of the, some of the uh, uh, humor in there because, as I was saying, humor almost immediately takes you out of the of the situation in a way. Um, when someone makes a joke in a very, you know, um, sad or grave or serious or angry um, time, uh, it almost immediately takes everyone out of out of that situation, uh, and it's it creates that distance. And of course, it, it also thrives when uh, you are already removed from, from that event. Uh, and um, yes, I think that that certainly helped me. Uh, also, we, we mentioned the linguistic distance uh, as well, which is to say my writing in English allowed me to say things that perhaps I might not have in Arabic or wouldn't have felt comfortable uh, doing in Arabic. Um, it's a bit like the kid at school who will uh, curse in in English but not in Arabic because for some reason you know God can't understand English and um, um, or or so or so we were told as kids and um, so the the idea is that that sort of linguistic distance speaking in a language which is not your own but which you can adapt and adopt and adapt uh, to your needs. Uh, and I think English is is, is very uh, fit for that uh, purpose. You know, a lot of uh, of cultures have, because it's become sort of like an international language. A lot of cultures have come in and changed it um, to fit their culture and what they want to say um, mm-hmm. and what they'd like to articulate. And we've got another question around um, the. The backdrop, the backdrop of the war, and specifically around, the, did the lack of information around the Lebanese civil war um, for the generations that followed drive you to write this novel? Um, I'd certainly say that the the, the lack of information created the, the gap for a lot of literature that came after. Um, the the civil war after the civil war period, um, and 
I think that the this gap, this absence of history books, uh, absence of willingness to, to discuss uh, what goes on uh, or what's been going on over the past 30 years, which is the systemic dismantling of any and every institution, um, um, any and every Lebanese institution, uh, in favor of a uh, system of, of militias and mafias and so on. And, and I think that that, that gap uh, certainly allowed literature to come in and, and uh, and, and, and make it stand. I think Elias Khoury, uh, the renowned Lebanese novelist, um, once said um, about Beirut that the only place for memory uh, in Beirut is in literature. And I think that that's very true, I think. Uh, the, the idea that um, a lot of memory um, has been removed from the architecture of Beirut, from the discussions uh, in, in Beirut about this war and about the history, and so much of that uh, is allowed to go on in literature and uh, literature alone. Mm -hmm. Reminds me also of what uh, this quote from Elias Khoury that he was talking, you know, when asking why do these, there, is there, do these conflicts keep repeating? Why have the civil wars repeated? And he says that's because they're, the Lebanese have not studied um, the history enough and it hasn't been discussed enough. And so as you were talking about, and literature, you know, most people hear the, the Civil War and they think of the recent Civil War, but it goes back to the 19th century, actually. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's cyclical. It's been happening, uh, you know, to and by and from every uh, Lebanese generation uh, since before Lebanon, really. And, and this, you know, the issue of, for instance, uh, Lebanese immigrants didn't start or immigration didn't start uh, in the civil war. It started um, long before there was Lebanon, even uh, back in uh, World War One, and even before that in the eighteen hundreds. Um, and so, yes, I think that, that, that that's certainly true. Um, uh, the idea that there is not enough of a discussion, and so literature comes in to fill that gap. Um, so you believe then that literature in this sense could have the power to, to break this cycle? <laughs> no. uh, um, I, I don't necessarily think that uh, literature in and of itself has the power to uh, break or mend um, anything. Uh, but I do believe that um, literature can, can uh, point uh, in that direction. Uh, and then it's that, that's that's all that uh, that I think uh, literature can do. It can reflect. It can point. Um, it can scream um, uh, in in anguish uh, and sorrow. It can uh, laugh uh, at at something. Um, it can point to the absurdity. Um, but it's mostly pointing. It's pointing at what's funny, what's sad, and. Uh, and what needs changing, and what uh, requires attention. Um, yeah, it's it's basically like a dog that yeah. barks loudly but wouldn't bite. I think. <laughs> I, I love that image. There's, I'm, I keep bringing this up because there's there's interest amongst the audience of you know what is the impact that you hope this this book will make, and and you've addressed that very clearly. Um, and as we've talked about literature as well and the role of literature in society and the role of artists in society, I'm wondering um, then if, if the solutions are outside of literature, right? How do you see, what is the situation like in Lebanon right now? And have you, you don't even have to have an answer for this, but thought of what steps are needed to, to necessarily um, break out of this cyclical cycle um, there's so many complexities and, and, and crises that are converging right now, but can you perhaps address a little bit about the situation in Lebanon right now as, as you're witnessing it and what you would like to see change um, within the context of the October Revolution as well, perhaps? Yeah, certainly. I think um, we were talking earlier about the issue of um, truth and, and the idea of truth and, and what it is and and I think in a, in a country like Lebanon right now and in the past, if you look at the, the, the issue of um, 
for instance, the you know the the, the um, civil war casualties or victims who uh, disappeared, uh, vanished, perished during the civil war. Um, and you can think, you know, where's where's their truth? When are we ever going to have the truth of what happened to them? And then, of course, coming back to now, what's happening currently? Uh, you know, the, the money perished. The money is gone. Everyone's money is gone. Uh, the lira has collapsed. Everyone's savings, uh, their, the money they set aside for retirement, um, their jobs, um, they're all gone. They've evaporated. And when are we going to have the truth uh, about that? What happened? Who's responsible? Um, and the truth about um, um, the Beirut port explosion, of course, you know, uh, when are we going to have a proper investigation? Um, why are, it, are there constant hurdles that uh, the truth as such has to uh, leap in order to get to us, uh, or we have to leap in order to get to it. Um, and yes, I think in terms of, of what's going on right now, there, there will never be a solution unless something uh, of, of, of accountability occurs, some sort of accountability occurs. And um, you know, when the civil war was over, the warlords granted themselves amnesty and said, "Okay, we're all we're all good. No one's a criminal. We will rule together." And by rule together, of course, they meant we will divide the spoils, um, and we will each take uh, a big chunk of Lebanon for ourselves. Um, and this, everything we're going through right now, can be traced back to that. Uh, the idea that there was no accountability after the civil war, no one was punished, no one was held responsible. Um, and therefore that set the trend, set the pace. Uh, and now what we have is a rehashing of that. Uh, and every so often we see it happen over and over again with the assassinations. No one ever knows who, who killed um, the intellectuals, the uh, writers, the politicians even. Um, there's never a truth. It's always just uh, thrown under the under the bed or the table or um, and forgotten about. Um, and you know, you, you could sort of say that about every single monumental event that's happened in or about Lebanon over the past uh, uh, more than a century. And um, certainly, the same answer uh, would be that in order to move forward, you must have accountability people who committed the crimes, or whatever those crimes may be, from uh, petty robbery to uh, murder, um, or and even corruption, it doesn't have to be robbery, just corruption itself, uh, must be held accountable uh, for their actions. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like then civil society probably plays a big role in trying to bring about accountability, if not a total restructure of the, of the system, which the revolution had articulated. Um, I'm wondering now, not to totally jump topics, but there is a, a question that I wanted, that someone asked that I thought was interesting, but did, did naming Adam, uh, was there a reason behind naming him at the, the protagonist of the book, Adam? Uh, well, to some degree, yes. I mean, I think that the idea of Adam comes with um, sort of, well, the name, actually, um, when I was writing my first drafts, um, my supervisor at the time who had a look at the novel asked me um, the question of why did you not pick a more Arab name? And, or why did you, why did you pick a very Christian name? And I thought, well, there are several answers to that. Firstly, uh, the idea that, yes, the Arab uh, can be Christian. And secondly, uh, Adam is a name that occurs in all of the Abrahamic religions. So it's, uh, it's one, of course, that can be um, found in, in Judaism, uh, Christianity, and, and Islam. And um, of course, the idea of, of having it's fairly obvious the idea of having a name that's neutral in that sense, and uh, perhaps you know it could be uh, conceived as a sort of a wink, uh, an ironic um, 
a, an inside joke between the parents uh, calling their son Adam, seeing as they uh, come from a, a you know different religious backgrounds, Christianity and Islam, um, and um, yes, so and of course there's the scene later on um, with the father and Adam's father and Adam himself, where um, the father says something like, "I am a human being," which in Arabic translates to uh, and a Benny Adam, which is I am I am I am son of Adam, um, and so creating this sort of inverse, uh, the, this sort of flip all of a sudden with the with the son becoming the father and the father becoming the son, I think um, sort of uh, brings that relationship um, forward. We're getting close to wrapping up. I do want to leave space since you know the overwhelming tome of this talk has been quite grim describing the talks to, to ask a final uh, fun question about the writing process. And something that I'm curious is what music do you listen to or were you listening to uh, while you were writing? What albums? Um, so th there was a, there were periods of listening to different albums. And um, one curiously, when I was, of course, uh, or again, very predictably, when I was in uh, in London or Lancaster, I would listen to a bit of uh, Feirouz or Ziad Um when, um, because of course I would. Um, and whereas when I was in, in Beirut, um, I just listened to pretty much anything on the radio that wasn't too disruptive um, or just uh, settle on one particular song um, and have it on repeat just to drown out the noise really um because as you know uh Lebanese homes are generally full of full of noise um and so I think for the most part uh the songs that I kept coming back to uh, were uh, primarily those of uh, uh Feirouz and Ziad Rahbeni um to be honest with you uh and yeah that's that's pretty much it Oh, we keep getting more questions <laughs> and, and they're interesting. I wonder if we have, we have a little bit of room left for, for maybe one or, or two final ones. So this question asks, uh, it quotes uh, an article you wrote in The Guardian where you mentioned your father's ambition was to become a poet. So how much of an influence was your father in you becoming a writer? Yes, of course. I mean, my, uh, my father and uh, my mother both um, uh, played a, an influential role. Um, you know, the fact that uh, they always seemed to uh, back me to pursue um, a degree in, in creative writing or literature when most um, young men in Lebanon were expected to, uh, as you probably know, become uh, medical doctors, lawyers, engineers, and if they fail, businessmen. Um, so the idea was that, um, I, you, you know, I, I think they they, uh, they showed me support very early on. Um, my, you know, my mother with her reading to us uh, when we were kids, and my father with his uh, setting an example. Really, um, you couldn't uh, when I was younger, you couldn't find him uh, anywhere without a book, and of course I I or a newspaper, and of course I used that in the novel um, as well. Um, and yes, it be, you know, having books become a part of daily life, I think, for children uh, and appreciating, uh, a, you know, a bookshelf can be the center of the house as opposed to, or an apartment as opposed to a TV screen. I think I say that with a TV screen uh, <laughs> behind me. Um, uh, so yes, I think that that um, certainly influenced my writing. There's, there's no doubt. Najee, are you working on a new novel? Uh, yes, but in the very early stages, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, it's to do with Beirut, of course, um, and uh, it's to do with the publishing industry in Lebanon and oh. uh, um, uh, sort of the, the idea of, uh, of how it, it struggles under the weight and pressure um, of, or simply being, uh, of simply being ignored or placed second or third or fourth or Tenth in the list of priorities, um, and yes, I think. The, 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 but as I said, it's it's still very early stages. Uh, although hopefully, uh, it'll pick up soon.
That sounds fascinating. Um, can we, um, I, my concluding question or remarks are, we're, I'm wondering, and I think a lot of us are wondering where we can buy uh, Between Beirut and the Moon. Um, yeah, thank you, AJ. You can, uh, so in Lebanon, you can purchase a book from uh, Antoine's. Um, it's available there at the moment. Uh, in, uh, in the UK, it's available uh, pretty much everywhere because um, that's where it was published. Um, so yeah, Waterstones or Foils or any independent bookshop, which I would encourage you to, to uh, visit. Um, but uh, it, uh, online, it can be purchased via Amazon uh, or the Influx Press website, which is the uh, publishing house uh, website. Um, and yes, I think that, that should probably be enough. There's also the audiobook if, if you're not into... Um, is that in your voice? <laughs> What's up? Is the audio boy? Uh, is the audio book in your voice? No, no. Fortunately for everyone, it's uh, it's not in my voice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Naj Naji. I've really enjoyed this uh, conversation. Thank you, AJ, and uh, thank you to Columbia Global Centers and to everyone who joined us.